The Art of Leadership Network. Self-help doesn't help when you're dealing with something that's that powerful, an influence that's that powerful internally. No one is seeing what I have done to this threat. I've made this threat terminal, and it's paralyzing. I can't move forward. I'm stuck. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. This is episode 384 of the podcast. Welcome. I'm pumped. Why? Because we are celebrating launch week of my brand new book, Healing What You Can't Erase. It's available right now everywhere books are sold. You guys, in this new series that we're stepping into starting today is going to be unique. I'm so glad you're here. It's not as much like an interview as you're used to, as it will be a side-by-side conversation between me and some really key people who've invested in my life, a few people who have endorsed the book. So today we're diving into the content from chapter six of Healing What You Can't Erase, which is called The Art of Surrender. And joining us is a man I talk about early on in that chapter. His name is Dave. He has counseled, mentored, and led me for almost 11 years. And together we're going to talk about the art of surrender under the hood. What does that mean? Well, Dave and I are not only going to unpack concepts from the book, but Dave is going to become your coach today for the last 11 years. As I said, he's been my mentor, my coach, my leader. Well, today you're going to hear from him. It's going to be like sitting up close with him for a counseling session, for a mentoring session. We're going to talk about the art of surrender and why surrender releases power in our lives. Now, ahead of our conversation, I want to invite you to do a few things. Number one, Get a copy of my book if you don't have it already, either in hardcover, Kindle, or audiobook format. And then follow me on Instagram. My handle is wintodaychris. This week, I'm giving away free Starbucks coffee as a simple thank you for your support of this show and celebration of my new book. I'm also going to be giving away a few signed copies of the book, and I'll be hosting a few friends for Instagram live chats about healing what you can't erase. You guys, it's launch week, and I'm excited to celebrate with you. After all, you are the reason I wrote this book. I want to see men and women just like you train for transformation, and that's exactly what this book is. It's a roadmap to transform your mental, emotional, and spiritual health from the inside out. So as much as I'm excited about the release of the book, I want this week to champion you and your pursuit of wholeness in your own life. Okay. Now we're going to get to the conversation with Dave in just a minute, but if you're enjoying win today, consider sharing it, especially this series, send a text to a friend and invite them to listen to. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening, especially on Apple podcasts and on Spotify. In fact, I want to highlight a recent review on Apple Podcasts. This one's from LaRoe VA. LaRoe VA wrote, Chris is an amazing interviewer. He asks incredible questions and goes deep into spaces the average podcaster wouldn't touch. I appreciate how earnest he is in thinking of how his guest can best speak into the lives of his audience. He truly understands the power of a transformed life and how to encourage listeners no matter the season or stage of life they are in. LaRoe, thank you for that generous five-star review. And if you, like LaRoe VA, are enjoying the show, do me a favor, review the show, rate the show, share the show. The reason when you rate, when you review, when you continue to share win today as you do, not only can we expand our listenership, but we get to tell brand new listeners that transformation beats self-help all day long. It really is as simple as that. You guys, thanks for your continued support. Thank you for your shared encouragement about healing what you can't erase. I'm excited to dive into the brand new series with you, Healing What You Can't Erase Beyond the Book, an under the hood look at transformation from the inside out. And this is my plan to train you for transformation. Let's get to my conversation with Dave. You're listening to Win Today on the Art of Leadership Network. Hi, Dave. Thank you very much. I'm so glad you're here. Um, you and Connie, as I talked about in the book, were catalysts to my own healing process. And I, I thought we would just dive in because, again, as I said, uh, this is beyond the book. This is under the hood. And I want to sort of go places I wasn't able to go in the book or um, perhaps even expound upon things uh, 
from the book. And I want to start here. Folks, this is, uh, is going to be chapter six of my book, The Art of Surrender. And I wrote this. You'll remember this because <laughs> we're in the room where this happened. So it's kind yes, of surreal to are. be talking about this. Um, 11 years yeah. after this all started. But I wrote this in chapter six. And this was in your presence with Connie. I said, for the first time in over a decade, I felt safe enough to drop my self-protective armor. I was exhausted and knew I couldn't carry the weight anymore. And as I let my guard down in that first meeting, I fell apart. Here's where I want to start today. That first meeting was in July, 2013. I wrote here, I fell apart. I want, I want you to tell people from your vantage point when I stepped into this office, what was I like? Well, let's let's back up. Okay. About almost two years before, we met mm -hmm. in November of 2011. Yeah. At a Jeremy Riddle concert. <laughs> That's right. And when when you meet someone and you're you're working at a church, so you have kind of a preconceived notion about this person mm -hmm. you know now we didn't have a lot of close contact really until that meeting that you're referring to mm -hmm. and you know we we come into uh, our personal ministry to someone really with kind of an open book I, you know mm -hmm. uh, Eugene Peterson says when he meets with someone for counseling, mm -hmm. He treats it as if he's walked into a meeting late. So, what does that mean? You have you don't walk into a meeting late and immediately start talking. Oh, you listen. Uh -huh. You have to get a feel for what what has been happening here before I showed up. Mm -hmm. So we do that with you, mm -hmm. and, and and part of this is just the, the call that's on our life. Mm -hmm. um, there's an atmosphere when we meet with someone, and it's safe. Mm -hmm. there's a safety and there's an atmosphere of I can finally say what perhaps I've never said to another person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what opened the door, and it just came tumbling out of you. I mean, so much pain, so much uh, really almost, you know, almost beyond pain. It was just the anguish of your soul, the things that you'd been through mm -hmm in your life up to that moment comes rolling out. Now, in our position, we have mm -hmm. to listen mm. and, and not make assumptions. We need, we need to let that roll out. And then after that raw emotion, mm -hmm. now we've got to go back and begin to ask the delicate questions, what brought you to, to this point? Mm -hmm. Uh, later, you know, as our relationship developed, we could put terminology to who the real Chris is. What do you mean? Say more about that. I, I really, <clears throat> I, I really want listeners to go, "Oh, we didn't know it was that bad," or whatever. I'm not trying to like um, aggrandize anything that isn't sure, but it is to say that sometimes. Well, I, I couldn't see what I needed to see in the moment. I couldn't see perhaps the level of soul depravity, brokenness, and need I was in, in that moment, right? Because it was just my sure. every day. Talk yeah. more about that. Well, when, you, when you meet someone and they, they open the cellar door to mm. their soul and all that emotion comes out. Yeah. You know, Kenny and I have been doing this for several decades. So you get a feel for, okay, we got a deep well here. Yeah. There's some things yeah. that have happened that are causing a lot of emotion. There's mm -hmm. no reason to be in a hurry. We don't need to rush. And our approach always is mm. we're following the lead of the Holy Spirit. Where does he want to mm. go to bring you more healing that results in freedom? So we have to, we have to stay at a pace mm. that 
doesn't rush too quickly, mm-hmm. doesn't cause a person that has a lot of hurt to recoil mm-hmm. and put up walls. Mm-hmm. So we've got to we've got to begin to walk this walk this out. I you know many moons ago I had a counseling class where we were instructed when you begin counseling with someone, what they initially give you is the presenting problem. It's never the root problem. So mm-hmm. what you get at the front end when you start a relationship where mm-hmm. you're going to uh, begin to, to, to go deeply within, mm-hmm. it can either be an honest assessment of you yep. that, well, this is what I'm experiencing right now, mm-hmm. and you don't know how deep the issue is, or you do know, and you're reluctant to voice it. So you, you've got to mm. kind of walk through that with someone and let them explain, here's, here's what's beginning to happen. When you start, you know, sometimes it's um, when you begin to say, why what you've been through what has been causing pain what what's been rolling on the loop inside of your soul um, as you oh, talk good. all of a sudden you begin to make more discoveries yourself but the secret sauce in this for us is the holy spirit is doing this he's the one the spirit of truth is the one that's flushing out the root causes mm. even sometimes events of the past that you had forgotten, but yeah. when the when the emotion is rolling out, often what comes with it is memories also. So you begin to think about things that you haven't thought of in a while, mm-hmm. and dots begin to get connected. And I think mm-hmm. that's where we we could see that, and we had to just begin to walk slowly with you. And one of the first discoveries that we made yeah. that that took a little time obviously, to put words to it, uh, but it was that you're a deep feeler. Mm-hmm. So when, when you have someone that is, and we, we may call them sensitive, a highly sensitive person. Yeah, for sure. But you've got to, you've got to allow the person to explain where they are without saying, uh, without, without teaching or teaching over. Well, then what you need to do is You've got to let somebody that feels deeply explain where they are, what they're experiencing, and then walk through that self-discovery with them. Mm. So that's that took some time with me. Sure. Let me ask you this then. So here I am. This is first meeting, and what ensued was a summer-long process of inner healing. And now here we are, fast forward. We've still been meeting every week for now. We're going on 11 years, which is phenomenal to think about. Okay, yeah. I, want to, I want to double-click on this because you talked about Oftentimes, the presenting issue isn't the issue. Did you guys get a sense or what did you get a sense was the issue behind the issue for me? I came in presenting an issue, but as we began to meet and process through inner healing, did you get clarity on? And if you did, what did you get a sense of? was the issue behind the issue that was keeping me stuck that we really needed to address well yeah that's 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 always kind of interesting because um you know it's it's kind of what came first the chicken or the egg um you you're feeling deeply the pain of some of the traumatic events that you went through as a child Mm -hmm. and then as an adult and and when your mom's illness came, you were 12. Yeah, almost. And, and it goes until you're 29. So you've got all these developmental years where you're feeling things, which is developing mindsets, mm-hmm. postures. Mm-hmm. But what we discovered as time goes on is the deep-rooted fears that were at work there. You know, what did the fear come because of the trauma or was there a proclivity toward fear that the trauma was made worse? I don't know. You, you Say can that never, again? Well, you know, sometimes you can wow. go through a, a very painful event and it creates fears. You ah, know, yeah. Trauma and pain is a teacher. So whether you Whoa. consciously or unconsciously know, when you go through pain, 
you can begin to make decisions within yourself. I'm never going there again. I'm never going to do that again. Okay. Can we poke on that? Say that again. And folks, listen, I, I know this is me and Dave talking, and I, I really want to give you the unpack, the unpacked nature of my story. But I want this to be a value add for you all too. Say what you said again, because pain writes a story. Yes. But it might not necessarily be true. Will you, can we just unpack that just for a second and then continue where you were going? Yeah, I, I think, and that's really just observations that we make. Sometimes, sometimes we make conscious decisions that can even become vows. Like what? Uh, uh, a woman goes through a bitter, painful divorce, and she's not really saying this to herself, but she just makes up her mind. You cannot trust men. I will never do this again. Mm -hmm. I will never be as vulnerable as mm -hmm. I was back then mm -hmm. going into the next relationship if there ever is another relationship. So you start to internalize the pain creates its own teaching moments. Don't go back there. Don't do this. Don't venture in. Okay, this is what I wanted to hear. Pain creates its own teaching moments, but it doesn't mean it's teaching us the right thing Right. Toward transformation and wholeness. Now, folks, you know this. I say this every week on the show. Transformation beats self-help. Come on, say it all day long. But pain writes its own narrative, and it might not be steering us. We think, oh, it's going to keep me safe, but safe doesn't mean smart and effective for transformation. It means survival, self-protection. Doesn't mean transformation, right? Yeah, and... You dang to to have to to live a fulfilling, productive life, you must take risks. You have to take risks. You have to venture in. You know, recently I I, I heard Jordan Peterson talking about that mm -hmm. where little boys we want to give them helmets and we want to protect them all the time. And he said they don't want to be protected. They a lot of boys who end up being leaders are pushing life to the limit. Mm. And so you learn how to manage pain. You learn how to manage danger. That can end up in producing a very exhilarating, fulfilling life. You, you, take, you take risks. If you fail in the moment, mm -hmm. you don't look at it as, I'm a failure. You, a healthy way is to say, that failed – I'm going to look at it as a temporary defeat. What do I need to do to adjust and then come back up to this barrier, this boundary, conquer it, then move on to the next one? That really is the process of maturity. So why do so many people misinterpret and then mislabel failure as an event that happened and then mislabel it, misinterpret it, misreceive it as an identity? Now, you and I have talked about this for years. Yeah. This was one of my core areas of wounding this happened that happened this happened that happened and therefore i am yeah it, you Ugh. it becomes identity yeah so then your experience becomes your identity uh, again coming from the perspective the perspective of i am a child of god jesus is lord and the holy spirit dwells within me mm -hmm. he's the one that i need to trust to interpret the things that are happening around me. Uh, children of Israel are going to go into the promised land. The, the, the 12 spies go out. Ten of them come back, come back and say, look, there's giants in the land, and we were grasshoppers in our own sight. Identity, mm. which made them recoil from what God says was his gift to them. They identified themselves wrongly. God is saying, no, I gave you this land. I'm with you. Take Take the land. It's all perspective. So when you start to go through painful events early in life, mm -hmm. your maturity level isn't at a point where you can properly identify these things. That's why as we become adults, we need someone to walk through uh, a review of past events to make sure that I haven't taken on a false identity <gasps> or a false perspective. So – yeah. Um, a child a child is raised in an abusive home and they can begin to think something is deeply wrong with me 
because my dad wouldn't beat me if there wasn't something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. So you start to think, I mm-hmm. am flawed. I am deeply flawed, or he wouldn't have he treated me like that. Mm-hmm. Your, your maturity is not allowing you to say, my dad is flawed. As you become older, you may see that. But when you're younger, you can't. It's 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 outside your purview. You can't you can't put all that together. Early traumatic wounds, early traumatic experiences color the way we see ourselves and yeah. life later in as we become adults later in life. Yeah. Totally dictated by your maturity level. Your huh. ability to understand. I wonder about this. I could be way off, but I'll just ask you to go here cuz we you've worked with me you've led me for so many years now okay suppose some of the huh let me preface this i do not define my life today and say i am a victim of life and the victim of circumstances right. and yet adversity did happen really early in life and it just kept going yeah. do you think that colored the way i related to not only life, but my outlook on my ability to be resilient by the time I came into your office for the first time. And then we had to sort of deconstruct lies, false beliefs to bring me back to almost like a baseline. Do you think that was sort of the case? Oh, absolutely. Say more about that. Absolutely, because if, you know, it, there are, there are, mindsets Mm -hmm. that we have early in life Mm -hmm. and it's difficult to tell where did this come from is it genetic or is it learned behavior i mean it's it's nature and nurture kind of thing yeah yeah some kids come up against a a difficulty and they're young Mm -hmm. they're they're real young but they're tenacious they don't give up they keep going until they accomplish it uh one of of my grandkids was like a toddler Mm. And he was trying to. They were at, everybody was at our house for dinner on a Sunday afternoon, and and he was. It was. I think he was. It was a high chair. He was in a high chair, and he mm. was having trouble getting out. So I slid it out the the tray and lifted him out, and he's he's screaming. And I'm thinking, what what what's going on here? Mm-hmm. When I put him on the ground, he climbed back up into the high chair, slid the tray on him because he wanted to do it himself. He didn't want me to help him. Now, where he was, he was a toddler. I mean, it, I don't know where that came from. I mean, that's where the nurture nature thing comes mm-hmm. from. But he had a mindset to tackle the hard thing. Other kids, not so much. Mm-hmm. They shy away from the difficult. They shy away from what they think is rejection, not being accepted, not being approved. I've got flaws. They they don't do well with challenges. So two kids can go through the same event. To one, it's traumatic. To the other, it's just difficult. So it's all about our perception, how we perceive the enemy, this thing that's in front of me. Is it a, is it a huge threat? Mm. Or is it, is it just a temporary little deal that I have to, okay, I just can't, overcame that. It's not a big deal. That's, that plays into the depth of the uh, effect of the trauma that I go through. So if I interpret it as, as life-threatening, now as I get older, I'm going to keep internalizing this deep fear. I'm not learning how to overcome it. So to overcome Whoa. it, there's going to be numbers of layers that have to be unpacked before I can do this. Now, the other aspect of this, and mm-hmm. again, I'm mm-hmm. coming from just the, the position of a follower of Jesus Christ, is there is a kingdom of darkness. And when they see the flaws in my thinking, they exacerbate. They make it worse. Mm-hmm. They make me think that I can never escape from this. I can never get free from it. This is where the premise of your book comes in. Self-help doesn't help when you're dealing with something that's that powerful, an influence that's that powerful internally. No one is, no one is seeing mm. what I have done to this threat. I've made this threat terminal, and it's paralyzing. I can't move forward. I'm stuck. The fears have gotten so heavy. I, emotionally, I can't carry that anymore. Mm. And you were at that. 
Okay, let's drill down on that. You know, um, what did you see again? You know, we, we poked this earlier. What did you see that I couldn't see that I needed to see in order for me to even begin to come out of the deep web of pain and the identity that was created that I received actually? Um, yeah, play that out. So often when you know we minister to people who are are in that situation where they feel overwhelmed by it's either an internal enemy or something external yeah. that they can't overcome yeah we then begin to to work at as a child of god you're never a victim i'm never a victim i'm never stuck I always have a way out because he has overcome everything. He says, mm. I'm an overcomer. He says, I'm more than a conqueror. I have to begin to get God's perspective of what this thing is. And that is so difficult. That takes reinforcement. That takes repetition. And it requires the pers person needing help to have a level of faith and trust in what God can pull off. If I know, and I knew your walk with God was stellar, so I'm going to keep it. Didn't feel that. stellar. <laughs> well, it, and, and it doesn't. Yeah, and right. that's where I have to remind you. Let's. You let's still remember. do 11 years on. You're like, hey, I mean, I walked through something last fall, and we can talk about it if, if you think it would be a blessing to people. But yeah, I mean, you have, in the last six months, you and Connie both have been like, hey, hey, refocus, refocus, refocus. Um, it's important yeah, because that's there's the there's the healing of the initial pain. Mm -hmm. There's the adjustment mm -hmm. of how you viewed that villain, that attack, yeah. that front that came to you. Then, ongoing, it it may never completely disappear. You know, I tell people, you read the Old Testament, mm -hmm. the Philistines just never go away forever. That it never goes away mm -hmm. because there are certain enemies that don't leave permanently. Even even Jesus, when he defeated Satan, the temptations in Matthew four, he went away for a time. Like there, there's certain yeah. things. Life means if I'm going to move forward, there's always going to be an enemy. It, it's always going to be there. Wait, wait, wait. Say that again. Let's put some legs on that. You said if we're going to move forward. In other words, there's going to be another giant, another mountain, another enemy. Another attack. Why? And why is this important for us to know? Because folks, listen. I talk about this in the book. This whole journey of transformation that beats self-help, this journey of healing from the life experiences that will never be erased from our story is a never-ending process. So therefore, it's not just about recovery and, oh, I can put that in a closet and finally the good life. You said that moving forward presupposes the fact that there will always be a giant, a level of adversity. Let me contextualize it. So like Paul said in Romans 8, 37, we know that in all these things, we are more than conquerors. That presupposes the fact that we will have something to conquer. Yeah. We put some legs on that. And, and what do we need to know then to equip ourselves as we move forward? So someone's joining us right now on the podcast and they're like, Chris, Dave, I'm walking through this right now. I can't see right in front of me and I can't wait till this is over. But what I think I heard you say is you move through it, you're prepared, you're strengthened, but you are being prepared because there will be another giant to slay. Yeah. I'm a little discouraged by that. <laughs> well, but yes, when you finally realize it's never going to go away permanently. Yeah. Perhaps. Now, I'm not saying every situation. I get but it. You've, Jesus said in this life you'll have tribulation. Mm hmm Okay, so difficulty, it, it's part of us. Mm -hmm. If you boil down all of our existence, yeah. it's light versus dark until Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. Mm -hmm. So there always will be the struggle of light, light versus dark. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to settle this. 
It's always going to be here. To what degree, what angle, where's it coming? Not sure. But if I get down in my soul, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, upon salvation, dwells within me. Yeah. I'm never alone. Yeah. Never alone. I draw, I have to learn to draw on his strength so that whatever comes up, I'm relying on his ability to beat it. This is this is the age old struggle. You know, and again, you and I have had these conversations so so many times. Um, and I really think it was it was within the last two years, I felt like I needed to make a shift in our relationship and start talking to you about toughness. And I've Take us there. I've uh, talked can, about it for a, yeah. a long time. And I, I draw back onto my athletic background mm-hmm. and played college football. And so within me, imagine I'm on the team, I'm practicing, I get in a game, and uh, the ball is snapped and somebody hits me. Mm-hmm. I don't look at him and go, hey, mm-hmm. what are you doing? Mm-hmm. No, everything that I've been doing the other six days of the week is to prepare me for this one moment. I am now ready to get hit and ready to give a hit. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. I have the equipment. I, everything is in, in place. It's the same way in the kingdom. I'm learning how to walk through life being led you know, chapter six is in your book is all about the, it's the art of surrender. I have to come to the point of surrendering to the uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. When I do that, and then I have to learn how to fight. And the fight is out of the surrender. His power is ri- rising up inside of me. You know, often Oof. we tell people, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah lives in you. We have to learn how to open the cage and let him out. That's... And and this you know I've been I've been at this for forty four years now so mm-hmm. there's the ebb and flow the ups and downs the, yeah the trial and error you know all that stuff I've got the scars I've I've got the band aids I've got the, the the stitches everything is in place you know trying to learn but as you start to put this together I now don't walk in fear it doesn't mean I'll never experience pain but if I do experience pain now. It's not a giant that comes at me. It's small. So I have a strategy. Mm. Whatever I get hit with, Mm -hmm. and we've talked about this so many times, Mm. I'm going to look to my Heavenly Father, and I'm going to say, what should I think about this? That's so hard sometimes when the lens of pain, the lens of the illusion of control, distorts the clarity that comes from I've set the Lord continually before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. That's yeah. sort of what I hear you saying, but that's, that gets distorted. Let's kind of go full circle with this. That perspective is distorted when the false self, the false identity, is cloaking itself over our spirit and our soul, right? Like, yes. let's just go here a little bit um the whole conversation about toughness i hated that (laughs) i know and i i know it's true but i couldn't reconcile well what what the frick do i do with this that i'm holding right now that is so painful and i've got this gaping open wound (laughs) And I'm bleeding out of my soul. And, and and I'm hearing, well, this is toughness training. I'm like, the last thing I'm thinking about right now is how to get strengthened. Yeah. Say a little bit about that. And then I actually want to take us, because you tipped your hat to it. You said, <laughs> through surrender, we get more power. That sounds like a contradiction, but we'll go there in a second. But, but talk to me okay. about the so open. I, whenever I talk about just toughness, um, and I, I, I don't want to give people the idea that I'm some kind of caveman. But no, you know, when you, you're not. When you no, play uh, sports that have high impact in them and, you, and you're the target, you have to learn how to take a hit. Mm-hmm. I've got to I've got to learn. I didn't give a hit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I should say. So years ago, um, I was working at an engineering company, and, and uh, I was in my early 20s, and this guy, uh, his name is Fred. 
and uh, yeah. he was one of the cool guys. You know, he was he was in his 30s, so he was an old man to us, and and he, he was just cool. Mm-hmm. You know, so we always we always listened to Fred's stories. You know, so we we're getting coffee one morning. And uh, Fred goes, man, I had this weird thing happen this morning. He said, yeah, what, what was it? He said, mm. uh, you know, Detroit area, uh, morning traffic. And he said, uh, merging traffic. And I had a little fender bender. Bumped another car. The other guy hit me, you know. So he said, we pull over on the side of the road and we get out. And this guy is irate mm. that I hit him. And he said, I didn't hit him. He merged into me. He he hit me. Yeah. He said, dude, I, I didn't hit you. You hit me. And he said, this guy punched me right in the mouth. Just bam. Whoa. And Fred was not a big guy. And Fred just took the punch, you know, kind of knocked his head sideways. And he looked at the guy and he said, if that's all the harder you can punch, you better get back in your car. And he said the guy turned around and got in his car. Now, that is what the goal is for a child of God and for someone who's going to be a disciple and is going to go into the darkness, walk in the light, and represent Jesus. You must learn to take a punch. Now, I, and again, mm. it's wow. this isn't some in in some cases this isn't natural. Some no. people are just raised; they're just tough. Mm-hmm. Others aren't. So it's developing the toughness. Where does the toughness come from? Perspective perspective i've got to get god's view of what just happened to me because i could have a tendency to exaggerate what just occurred that's what creates inordinate fear i need god's perspective and this is where it's helpful for a younger man to have an older man to give him the right perspective Uh wait a minute tell me what happened okay I think you need to think about this. Mm-hmm. Have you viewed it like that? Have you, let's look, and it's working through because this is wow. the renewing of the mind wow. and the soul that takes so much time and repetition. We can all get there, and we all will get there at different times, but it's the repetition of perspective changing. So let's double down on this. Um, let's say someone is just not sure what to do with the word toughness because it just they don't have a grid for it yeah. yet. Yeah. Feel free to correct me as you do because we're sitting in your office and <laughs> here we go. <laughs> but could it be said that synonymous with in in context what we're saying is strength of character, resilience in other words, Romans chapter 5 verse 2 ESV says, "Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God." Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let me double down on that. Suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Toughness produces enduring faith. Count it all joy, brethren, whenever you encounter trials of many kinds for the testing of your, folks, listen, it's not the testing of your character. It's the testing of your faith. Yeah, yeah. Is it? What do you think about that distillation? <laughs> that, do you think well, that's, that's synonymous? It. That's it, yeah. Because toughness really, for a, a biblical word, is perseverance. So it's the resiliency to be able to get right. hit by the truck, but to wait and get up and and keep moving. Now, if someone's listening to me and you've gone through a, a horrible loss, oh my gosh. I wouldn't I wouldn't diminish your pain at all. Not at all. But what I want you to see is that God can walk through it with you and can give you a new perspective and bring the healing that only he can bring. There it is. Because I can't know the depth of the pain that I'm in. Mm. Only the Spirit of God can divide between soul and spirit. You know, we're told in Hebrews, it's the Word of God, the living Word. That's right. That's the the name of Jesus. That's right. He, the, the, the healing comes from him, and so... Faith 
trust him when I have absolutely no idea what to do. A learned behavior is waiting on him, trusting him to do what you just said, the mm-hmm. scripture you just read. I'm going to trust God to produce that. Mm-hmm. I, I look at it, mm-hmm. but I can't, in my flesh, in my humanness, I can't pull that off. He's telling me what mm-hmm. he's going to do. Mm-hmm. And so faith says, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you to do the, bring the transformation within me that I, I cannot do it. Now, yeah. usually the way that you get there, I can't do it, is because you've tried for years to do it and you're exhausted. And we're back to the thesis of the book, really. Yes, I tried, I'm exhausted, I tried, I'm worn out. Why is this not working? Why can't I fix myself? Why can't I heal myself? Surprise, you can't. So uh, my wife, Kenny, has had numbers of healings. um, And yeah, profound. it's just so inspiring. And one of those was she had uh, really intense depression for Mm -hmm. years. Mm Mm-hmm. And at the time, it was getting to a point where something something had to happen. And so she came to me and she said, "I'm I'm really getting to the point where I'm 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 I can't I can't deal with this anymore." She's trying to put words on it, and I know, having now been married for so many years, that whatever she's saying, it's worse than she's saying. She doesn't exaggerate. So she um, is. As her custom, when she's in a bad place, she's alone with God uh, in our home. Everybody else is in bed, Bible in her lap. And the prayer for her that seemed to get the most result is, Lord, if this is going to change, you have to change it. Yeah. So she she reached that point, because she's a hard worker. So she reached that point where she saw, I can't do this. And in that moment, mm. and you know, why? How did this happen? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. You know, sometimes the the powerful things that God does are seem so random. Um, she describes it: depression was lifted off of her like a blanket. Dang. And she she sat there dumbfounded. She didn't tell me anything for three days because she assumed tomorrow morning when I wake up it's going to be there. Because every day of her life. Uh huh. Horrible headaches, uh-huh. depression, black hole, everything. Just no, 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 no extreme joy. Just but but she's a hard hard worker, so she's mm-hmm. doing the tasks necessary to raise a family and do everything. But just this dark blanket, and it lifted, and she had to learn how to live without it because it had been. A <gasps> oh my gosh. So this is the renewing of the mind. Even when God shows up in his power, there's still adjustments to be made. It, the uh, the oh. transformation of learning how to live free, that's a, that's a transformation that happens also. The transformation of learning how to live free because for so long, the false identity, the false self yes. has, has influenced us influenced us to the extent that our true identities in Christ are indistinguishable from yeah. the very thing we thought, this is my lot in life. Hmm, my Your gosh. label gets ripped off and you feel naked. And that experience in and of itself is very disarming. Yeah. That tension of transition, being vulnerable, that liminal space of, okay, I, I preached a couple of months ago and you guys were there and in the message, I remember saying, after we throw off the outer garment, Mark 10, yes. it's disarming because we're in the liminal space of transition and many in the body of Christ right now, I mean, we can swing this a little bit because you minister to a lot of men, a lot of people, you yeah. guys minister to a lot of people. How many people do you think right now are in the process of shedding the old garment and they're a little freaked out because the liminal space is more disarming than they suspected and they thought, shoot, maybe I should go back. Well, we've been taking people through this personal ministry process for 17 years. And for the first many years, it was primarily women. Mm. Women are always ready to deal with their inner stuff. And in the last few years, there's been a, a strong uptick of men that, that we see. Yep. And most people that we see, I would say at least 80%, are in some capacity of leadership. 
pastors, uh, you know, leaders in their church, business leaders. They're just leadership kind of people. I've never seen so many people in a state of internal flux. Who am I and where am I going and what in the world is God doing? Just just lost. Now, I went through that process. Yep. And, you know, you and I, we have these conversations. It's being in the caterp- the caterpillar mm-hmm. is in the cocoon mm-hmm. and you go through the goose stage. You're in between uh, the caterpillar and the butterfly and you are mush. And and I think you can identify with that. It's like I don't know how to feel. I don't know what to feel. I don't know what what to work on. You know, Kenny and I we were kind of in that stage together. We just said, Lord, we are determined today to do what you put in front of us. That's yeah. how we yeah, were, yeah. That's how we would just just to maintain purpose. We're just gonna one step in front of the other. But when you've been leading, especially people who have led at a high level, and you enter into this period, um, this this takes in, you know, when I started doing a lot of research just on leadership development, mm-hmm. this is a common season that many leaders go through. In fact, some say that there's two or three of these seasons of transition that a person goes through where God is remaking you. You've reached a point where what you know and how you operate has bottomed out. And for you now to work at a high level serving God in the next season of life, you have to go through a stripping and a transformation that is so difficult when you've been in a responsible place. It's hard to back up and do nothing. It's so funny you say that. Uh, in the last few episodes on the show, the conversation have, has just sort of come to be where I've mentioned uh, Janet Hagberg, Robert Gulick, their book, uh, The Critical Journey. And we've been talking about that yeah. wall yeah. where we all hit the wall. Um, when Ronald Rollheiser was on the show, we talked about the dark night of the soul. This keeps coming full circle. You and I in this office have talked a lot about that. Um, yeah. You know, it's really interesting. And, and maybe, I love your insight on this. You and I in this office, uh, here we are, March 2024, but in the summer of 2022, I was writing this book that yeah. a lot of folks are holding in their hands now, and yeah. I'm so thankful for that. And I remember saying to you right here, like, oh my gosh, can you believe, it? I'm so glad what I... I made it through it. I did it. And then 2023 was one of the (laughs) hardest years. No, it was the hardest year of my life since the year I wrote about chapter one, the year my mom died, and then I'm diagnosed with MS. 2023 punched me in the freaking gut. Yeah. In, I have it in my journal. I didn't bring it with me, but mid-October, you and Connie were on the phone with me for like two and a half hours because I felt like I got thrown way back into the pit again. Yeah. What do we do? What would you say to folks who are joined with us today saying, I feel like I finally just was able to take a breath again and I got blindsided. (laughs) That's a crowded bus right there. Because there's a mm. lot of people that are feeling that right now. Yeah, why? Why do you think the Lord? Do you think like this is part of what the Lord's doing in the body of Christ for maturity and purification, so that, or is this just what a lot of people are walking through? Because we're living in a crazy, crazy world. Both and. Wow. I don't know. That's that's opening up a big can of worms. Yeah, for sure. So the, the big picture, because I'm a big picture guy, I like to know. Okay. Yeah. What, why are we doing what we're doing? Yeah. Right. I think God's about to pour out His Spirit. Amen. On his people, Amen. that there is something coming that's so big, mm. he can't entrust it to us in our present state. So if we're going to have leadership that can sustain a move of God, um, if anybody was tracking on any kind of revival, February 8th, 2023, God moved at Asbury University. Powerful what happened. Do you remember? 
do you remember the the conversation we had in here and then about just kind of speaking about what the Lord was doing and then you had a message that you sort of released to the body of Christ and we're like, whoa, people are ready for this. Yeah, they're hungry for yeah. it. Yeah. People want revival. They want an outpouring of the Spirit, but they haven't come into the understanding of what it takes to get there and sustain it. And this is the key word, sustain. If I'm going to be a leader who, let's throw another word in here, sustain and steward a let's move go. of God. Let's go. I must be purified and and God must Dang. do the deep work in me so that I realize it's not me. It's it isn't me. It isn't my program, mm-hmm. all of my mini series. It isn't me being a presenter. It's me being a surrendered minister of God, laying myself at his feet, willing to do whatever he wants and allowing him to open up every closet door in my soul and start cleaning it out. It's a painful process, but when you look at the revivals that have have lasted a while yep. through history, it's always led by a few people who have been through the fire for maybe a, a long period of time. This is what I want. I mean, this is this is why I do what I do. Yeah. God has done a deep work in me and shown me that I'm not who I think I am, and that if I truly mean I surrender to you, he 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 thinks I was serious, so mm. he takes me through the fire. And again, I come back to an athletic experience where I had coaches who, you know, my college coach, uh, when he recruited me, I thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But then when practice began, he was mean as a snake. Well, what happened? <laughs> what did I do in between when you recruited me mm-hmm. and when practice mm-hmm. showed up? Well, now... I, he's he we're we've moved from him bringing me onto the team let's call it salvation yep and preparing me for battle so to prepare someone from battle for battle you take them through toughness training what's toughness training it is when you put some un, someone under high duress for a period of time teaching them how to keep the focus on the goal even though there's all this pressure wow then that high duress period is followed by rest so that's how you create a world class athlete high stress training and then a period of rest and nutrition and this is why that's what we can have in Christ we can go through training, we can go through difficulty, but then he leads us into a place of rest. And the place of rest is within us because he's the prince of rest. The, the greatest scripture for this is in Hebrews 12. Okay. And shortly into that chapter, you know, it begins talking about let's set, off, set aside the, the sin that so easy, easily besets That's us. Right. That's right. How do we do that? Looking unto Jesus. Then he moves into whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So he goes from besetting sin, you got to look to Jesus, and then he starts talking about chastening. Why? Besetting sins are usually purged with chastening. Mm -hmm. And the, the root word of chastening is to strike. So God has a toughness training in him for those who want to reach maturity, the, mm. the fullness of the stature of Christ. If you want to get there, Ephesians you're going to have yeah. to go through tough, tough stuff. Now, you get further into that chapter, and he says, uh, hold those arms up that, that, uh, and the, the legs that are weak. Why? They're going through the chastening process is happening, and it's difficult. Those of you who are around them, mm-hmm. hold them up. Mm-hmm. The hands that are that are hanging down, You're, you, it's exhausting to go through these training periods mm-hmm. where God shows you what's really going on inside of you, mm-hmm. and the shift. Making deep seated mindset change is, changes is hard because. Within, it's just not a matter of, well, I just need to read the behavior in the book and then just do it. No, the Holy Spirit has to show us the emotional attachment that we have. Like we have mindsets that we, we're betting our whole life, I have to think like this. 
We're not telling each we're not telling ourselves that. We're feeling ourselves that. He has to show us that and and make a shift. That's why as a free gift, he gives you the fruit of the spirit. He gives you new emotions. Love, joy, peace, those are emotions. So he replaces it with a toxic emotion, puts it in his holy his holy spirit puts a new emotion in me and begins to retrain my thinking, which is through the word of God and his Holy Spirit, enlightening it. We're talking about maturity. Um, You've said so much in the last few minutes. We're not just talking about changing our mind. We're talking about changing our mindset. Yes. The default program that dictates how we see everything in life. Folks, you might be saying, well, why, why, why? I'd like to propose this as why. Romans chapter 8, verse 19. For the whole of creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. This call to sonship, Paul talks about this at length in Romans 8. I think Romans is just his masterpiece. Why? Because sonship is not a gender-specific term. It is a positional term. He's looking for maturity, the sons to rise up, sons, men and women who are filled with the Spirit, who can be a drink offering for the world. This is sort of the meta narrative of my book. And I don't want to give too much away if you just got it, but like, I'll just say it. Healing what you can't erase isn't so we can live the good life. Whatever that means, we are transformed to be agents of transformation. We are restored to bring restoration to those who are broken in our world because we are not the point of our own stories. It's so funny because this is like a, I don't know, catch 22 or I don't know how you phrase it, but healing what you can't erase as a book itself actually is going to sit in bookshelves in the self-help section, <laughs> but it is anything but a self-help book because after we're healed, and transformed, well, the process of transform- transformation doesn't stop. Right. Here's the point. We are transformed. there's some spikes in there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, for sure. It, like, this is because we are part of God's eternal purpose, and, and there is something for us to steward. You were talking about this yeah. this fresh move of the Lord coming to the earth, and, and, and we are the agents of stewardship for that. I want to play on this. I'm not creating a theology on this, but I've seen this quote a few times and I hate it so much. It's Spurgeon. Here's Spurgeon. Whenever God means to make a man great, he always breaks him into pieces first. That's what we've been talking about in a way, right? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, Let's take this into this concept then. Assuming what we've been saying is about a training process, training for reigning, training for maturity in life. That's that's what this is about. Yeah. And I'll say this as a precursor. I was in so much pain. You guys knew it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were there were weeks that I would come in and some recent, like super recent, where I would just sit on that couch across the room and cry. Yeah. And the tears were so heavy. But I love the Lord so much and I cannot deny that I want to be part of his purposes. I want to be able to steward something. So even though I'm like, I just want out of pain, this sucks. Many of us, many of you are like, I look in the mirror and I I want to be used by the Lord. I want my life to count. Yeah. I want my life to count. I want my life to count. And we're saying, yeah, you are being transformed. You are being yeah. filled with the Spirit so that you will walk forward in life bearing scars, yes, but those scars will tell a story of His faithfulness and bear testimony and witness to the fact to others that He is undeniably faithful and trustworthy despite what life and the events of life have told you about him because a believed lie empowers the lie and creates strongholds in our minds which causes us to pull away from the very source of life we need okay 
earlier in the conversation, I just want to say, I love this. This is so great with you. Thank you. I love it too. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Seriously. Oh well, yeah. Earlier in the conversation, you said that surrender releases a level of power to us. That sounds like really contradictory. I want to set this up. I'll just read you uh, from the book. So uh, folks, again, this is uh, chapter six. I wrote this. I said, in my earliest sessions with Dave and Connie, surrender looked like giving up self-preservation and control. And I did. Like loosening my grip on the safe, small life I had compulsively constructed. Why? Because of fear. Fear of more loss. Fear of losing control. I went on to write this, but over time, surrender took on a new form. And we'll get to your statement. Instead of giving up, surrender became about giving in to a process of confrontation that would lead to transformation of my life from the inside out. And friends, listen, the same is going to be for you too. So let's go to your statement. Surrender releases a level of power. We think surrender is like, I give up. I resign to a life of apathy and whatever happens, happens. But you're saying surrender releases power. And I'd like to back that up by saying that's because true surrender is not about giving up. It's about giving in. It's saying, I am fixing my focus. I'm giving in. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go through this. Take this wherever you want. Any great athlete knows what you're saying is absolutely true. Giving in mm. produces more power. You got to be coachable. So if you're not coachable, you can't make the necessary adjustments. Um, a great dancer knows that. A great violinist knows mm -hmm. that. A great athlete mm -hmm. knows that. Anybody that's coachable, Tiger Woods in his in his mm -hmm. heyday mm -hmm. had a coach. Mm -hmm. So giving in is when you're giving in to an authority that's greater than you, wiser than you, stronger than you, smarter than you, and has greater resources. You give in because you've experienced them. And this is where the power that results mm. in this transformation process, mm -hmm. the fuel to keep going, through the pain is love. It's a passion Whoa. for God. Faith works by love. Yeah, Galatians and, 5 says I, that. I can't, because I've seen this in you for years. Yeah. You couldn't stop the process because you love him. Break, Even though you break don't that understand down. You got to break that down for people because you know me, you and Connie know me so, so well. We meet here every week. What do you mean by that? Your passion. And this is, I don't know what produces this, you know? I know in my own life, people were praying for me and God did something to me. I did not ask him to change my life and put me on this path. In late March of 1980, God changed my heart. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I loved him. I loved his word. I don't know. I didn't ask him. Yep. I wasn't asking him. Yep. Somewhere in your past, you were exposed to the love of God. You were exposed to who he is, mm -hmm. his presence, his mm -hmm. power. I mean, those church experiences that you tell me that you, that you had when you were a kid, I oh, mean, it was just powerful, powerful people of God. Marked by his spirit. Speaking the word into your life, prophesying. Just you were encountering, you were encountering the real God, and it was magnetism. You wanted more. Everybody doesn't respond like that. As I see it, you know, where Jesus said, wide is the gate to destruction, narrow is the way to life, and few there be that find it. Mm -hmm. So there are a few, there's a remnant that will not stop. There are, there are people that don't make it. They're washouts. That's super sobering. And it, it, it's sad. It is. And I, and I always feel, when I feel like somebody's backing off, I'm doing the best I can to be God's salesman. Like, come on, keep going. Keep going. You can do this. We can do this together. Mm -hmm. You can do this. I know it's painful. Mm -hmm. So the passion for God, and I like that, rather than saying I just, I love God, I have a passion for him. Mm -hmm. When I saw him, 
in a way that I'd never seen him before. Yeah. Who could resist that? Mm-hmm. Who, who could say no to the kindest, most gentle, most powerful being ever known? And he made himself available to me. And he's saying, come on, come on, keep coming, keep coming. It, I have to engage with the process. Right. But it's a love for him that I was willing to give myself. You know, again, playing playing sports. I, I had some, I was blessed with great coaches growing up all yeah. the way through. And some of those men, I would have done whatever they asked me to do. I knew they had a high opinion of me, and I had a high opinion mm-hmm. of them. And were they hard on me? Yeah. My college football coach actually kicked me. Yeah. And it, I didn't, it didn't offend me. Huh. And I always figured, I, I'll do whatever you say as long as I can play. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to take this and sit on the bench. And this is, I want to be engaged. I want, Lord, use me. And when I, so somewhere in your past, you made it clear, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm not backing up. I'm not running away. I'm all in. Sixth grade, I can remember it. It's so funny you say that. Yeah, I remember the day. What I did, said it in my heart. I, I, you know, it was just this. What brought you to that? What happened? I love how the Lord works in community because I had found my people. Uh, I'd found my people. Yeah. And it wasn't simply, I want to run with these people for the rest of my life. It was. I want people to know freedom and life. I, it's so funny because in sixth grade, I'm not sure I had the language for what that even means. Uh, All sure. I know is I had tasted, oh my gosh, by eighth grade, <laughs> you know, like you and I talk about this. It was like Sunday night youth group, no air conditioning in the building. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not trying to like, jest at youth today and all that but youth church today i think is a little different than youth then we were like no air conditioned building three hour service we're getting laid out and you know preaching to us was a hero in my life who went to be with the lord four years ago and she was in her i would say at the time mid 70s probably at the time (laughs) and we're getting leveled and i'm going I want everyone to taste this. I want everyone to taste the reality. What exposure. Of the kingdom of God. Yes, what exposure. Wow. Well, this is interesting then. So let's stay here. Stay on surrender releases power. What else do we need to know about that? Because I, there was a level of surrender in my life. I think what we were getting at here is I said, yes. I said, this is why I'm on the earth. I'm not giving up. I'm giving in. Surrender, you said, releases a level of power. So I've got a, a four-step process that I kind of, yeah. when I'm talking with someone, I'm trying to evaluate where they are in this. It's believe, surrender, listen, obey. Mm-hmm. So in order to surrender, you have to believe. You have to have faith. You have to believe that God is, that he loves me and he's provided me with something. And, and for people listening to us, that's where, if you haven't had that moment, that's what we want. We want you to have a personal encounter with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. That's it. Full stop. That's where it starts. Full stop. You must encounter him and believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him. Mm-hmm. Out of that, you now have a choice. Will I use him as an advisor or is he Lord? Oh boy! Yeah, because I'm Say I'm more. not going to give in to somebody who, eh, substitute teacher, helpful suggestions. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm I'm not going to surrender to that. The people that give their life to the kingdom of God, to Jesus Christ, have encountered Him at a deep level. And again, that's that's that when you see Him as He is. I I Jeez. have men that come to me who were raised in an atmosphere of judgment, and harshness, and legalism. Yep. And they give me their story, and they they talk about um, just the harshness, and, and they, there's, there's a level of faith in them, but there's this bitterness th- for the past. Mm-hmm. And so what I tell them is, as best as I can, I want to communicate to you the real God as I see him. 
He's a balance. He's a balance of accountability and love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace. That's that has taken me forty-four years to mm-hmm. absorb mm-hmm. into my own thinking. But that the surrender has to come because you've encountered him. Then I'm willing to listen. Listen. And and I love what you said a minute ago. It's in a community. That's right. You can't do this. No. You you can't reach full potential alone. This has to be with other people, an exchange of ideas mm-hmm. where you're safe. You can you can say what's in your soul and the things that you're wrestling with and get input from people. I don't know about that. And you know, this is where where I, you know, I had a pastor that said, let's all try to fumble the ball in the same direction. Mm-hmm. Like we're all trying to work at this the best we can, and we're all doing it imperfectly, mm-hmm. but we want one another to have an encounter with him. That's what you surrender to, the real deal. That's where it has to start. I suppose we can begin the descent of the conversation this way, and I'll let you sort of pilot us there. Um We've been talking about surrender. We've been talking about freedom and transformation and healing because we are after that. This plays right into the work that you do with so many people every every day in this office. I made this statement in the book. Freedom and healing come not to the person we're pretending to be, but to the person we are today. Meaning... The very things that we perceive to be unworthy of bringing into the light are the very things that are necessary yep. for transformation, for healing. I, I pulled this out of my Bible. This this paper that I'm holding right now. That's a typical criticism right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Might as well tell the people what you mean by that. Because well, there's a whiteboard in the other office. Say more. Yeah. Hey, let's just you, tell the people. <laughs> you're Mr. Charts and Graphs and Boxes and Circles and Arrows. And Sorry. <laughs> you talk with the end of your arm, <laughs> which is I, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so this paper that I pulled out of Mark 10 in my Bible, you and I were sitting right over there on the couch, and I had one of these moments. You handed me that that notebook right there, and I just started to write. Yeah. Here's what I wrote. In isolation, we adopt the believed lie as seed. The believed lie could be about who we think we should be or who we think we really are, but it's based on a lie. So when we isolate ourselves, pull ourselves off of the vine, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Mm -hmm. We can unintentionally decouple ourselves from the vine and therefore wither. And that's where the broken spirit thrives. In isolation, we adopt the believed lie as seed and thus suffocate and atrophy our spirit. So Proverbs talks about really the broken spirit. So the seed is planted. I think I wrote this probably three or four years ago, maybe five years ago by now. I wrote this. The broken spirit conceived by the seed of ungrieved losses, unresolved disappointment, believed lies, takes shape and form until it's born as the false self. We clothe and swaddle the newborn false self in believed lies Shame, self-pity, entitlement, regret, and bitterness. And we, through self-protection, keep the infant alive near to our hearts as we relate to the world through shame and blame, fear and control. And we've nurtured that little baby for so long that it's like, it's a part of us. It becomes us. We become it. And you walk a ton of people every week in this office through. Give him the thing that you hold dearest, that you think is the only safe thing that you have left. And the Lord says, I won't reject it. I won't reject it. I will transpose, transform, renew, restore. Land this plane for us. We've talked about so much. We've talked about surrender, releasing power. We've talked about coming to him in truth. We've talked about toughness training. Oh, um, where do we land this conversation today as we're contextualizing the art of surrender and the call to do so? I just want to say this like flat out, folks, you're exhausted, you're tired, you don't know what your next move is. It's not to look down and in and life hack your way to transformation because you can't. It is to move in the opposite spirit 
which is not I give up, it's I give in, the art of surrender. Land this plane for us. I want everyone to have an encounter with the real God. Everybody. The presence, the power, what he's really like. That's why we need revival. That's why we need mm-hmm. an outpouring of spirit. Yeah. That's yep. what they encountered at Asbury College in, in a, now Asbury University. That's what it was. They had an encounter with the real him. At that point, surrender is easier because you know what you're surrendering to. When you call people to surrender to God and they don't really know him, you can't surrender to a, a, a picture. You need, the, you need the real encounter. When that occurs, I can tell you from personal experience, you will win if you don't quit. You will win if you don't quit. That's a word for someone right now. You will reach a level in your life of fulfillment and productivity that you didn't even know existed because he, one of his names is life. Mm. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. One of the names of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of life. This is abundant life. That's what he produced. I can't produce that. I can't produce that. The wages of sin is death. I can't, I am broken. When I finally realize who he is and who I Mm -hmm. am not, Mm -hmm. then I'm ready to surrender to that and he will put me back together. What I think would be a great life probably isn't going to line up with the truth. And if I know the truth, the truth will set me free. Dang. That's the goal. I now know he is the God of freedom. He is the God of broken chains. I'm going to stay there. I'm going to stay on that track. If I keep going, the life that I will discover has one level of goodness to another. I can never bottom out. He's infinite. I can never bottom out on that. I'm all in. I'm all in, and I'll never back off from that. Oh, my gosh. Thanks for being here today. Seriously, I I mean, I've been looking forward to this conversation because, you know, By the time folks read the very first sentence of chapter six, I say in here, most Wednesday nights for the past several years, I've met with an incredible man named Dave. Our meeting is one of those immovable commitments. And it's true. Like we meet every week. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your commitment to me, you and Connie. If she was in the room, I'd say thank you again. Um, But you've been a father figure, a leader in my own life. And I really think like you're really pulling people out of the out of the goo today um let's land here pray for us <clears throat> father thank you for being a good god a father that cares a father that provides and protects and lord i ask that you would reveal yourself yeah. your true identity that you would reveal yourself especially to the one right now yep who's listening in their vehicle on their porch, on the treadmill, that you would reveal yourself in great power, that the reality of who you are would surround them in whatever space they're in right now, and that they would encounter your your love and your hope the hope that you can give to a person who has experienced deep brokenness, Mm -hmm. that you are the God of hope. Manifest yourself there. Give them the gift of life that comes by faith. If they believe, they can be transformed. They can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to to the kingdom of love, of your dear son. Lord, manifest yourself to that broken place and put them on a path you, Jesus. to greater life, greater freedom, greater wholeness. Heal that area in their soul mm-hmm. that they have been mm-hmm. trying to erase and can't. They can't get there. I thank you for being a faithful God and a God who cares for the broken. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Healing What You Can't Erase. Be on the book week one. 
Head to the show notes now at wintoday.tv slash episode 384. That's wintoday.tv slash episode 384. Grab a copy of my new book, Healing What You Can't Erase. Right now it's available everywhere books are sold. We'll listen next week on the podcast, Healing What You Can't Erase Beyond the Book Part 2. This time with Jamie Winship. We're talking all about emotions as flashlights, inner healing, and so much more. You know, every time Jamie's on the podcast, it is a huge deposit to all of us. Here's a preview. The impatience, not true. The patience, true, but the impatient has become the true part of you. So, so in confession, I can say to God, I feel like you're punishing me for the rest of my life for these actions. That's what I really believe about you. So I can't. So I have to spend all my time in apology, right? In in in, in trying to trying to fix everything. Now I got to go be a missionary, or now I got to go, you know, live in a situation that I don't like because I'm paying back. And it's a it's a life sentence because you don't know the truth about God. And in order to know the truth about God, you have to tell Him the truth that you do know that you do believe in order for the exchange to occur. That's next week right here on Win Today as the Healing What You Can't Erase Beyond the Book series continues. Hey, come hang with me on Instagram. All of the book launch fun is happening there. I'm at Win Today Chris. Here's what's going down. Free Starbucks coffee, an opportunity to win a free signed copy of the book. Instagram live conversations with friends like Dr. John Deloney, Ian Simpkins, David Nurse, and Hannah Brencher. So much more. I'm excited. It's book launch week. Healing What You Can't Erase is available now everywhere. Books are sold. I love you guys. Thanks for hanging out today. Don't miss next week's conversation with the one and only Jamie Winship. Until next time, have a great week. We'll talk to you really soon. Bye-bye.